My name is Dwayne Davis, and I'm the Executive Director of K-12 Education Initiatives at the University of Chicago. And we want to welcome you to the final session in our parent and caregiver series. Um, we're really excited about um, our final session. Um, and all of our sessions are, our previous sessions are available on the UEI YouTube page, the Urban Education Institute YouTube page uh, from our summer sessions with uh, teachers um, and our latest sessions for caregivers and, and parents and families. First, I wanted to uh, thank our planning committee um, led by Dean Deb Gorman-Smith, uh, the Dean of the School of Social Service Administration at the University of Chicago. Uh, Maggie Walsh, Todd Barnett, Franklin Cozy Gay, Tanisha Washington, and Adrian Talbot uh, for helping to bring together our partners and our communities to try to support uh, anyone we can uh, in the city of Chicago or across the country during this challenging time. Um, and next, I would like to do a couple of housekeeping notes. You also see that in the chat. Um, everyone is muted. Uh, we do have closed captioning available. So if you look at the bottom right hand corner, uh, closed captioning is available for this session. We will have time for Q&A um, at the end of the session, but if you want to um, add a chat, um, you, you, can, you can add a chat. Um, it's open for questions until, until the end of the session. Uh, the session is also being recorded, so everybody that is currently present, everybody that registered for the program will get a copy of the video emailed to them, the email address you register with, a copy of the deck, um, as well. So we, the resources will be sent to you uh, very, very soon this week um, um, after the session um, has ended. Um, so with that being said, um, I'd like to also thank uh, the, the person that we connected with in order to um, have our illustrious guests this evening. Um, they're going to introduce themselves, but I do want to shout out Kahari Humphreys and Thrive Chicago. Uh, we reached out as a planning committee to see if there was a possibility that we could work together to bring something to the community and they graciously agreed and connected us uh, with with their working group uh, from the other organizations that you will be introduced to momentarily so um, good evening thank you for being here i'm now going to hand it off to kahari humphreys thanks uh thank you duane appreciate it <clears throat> And it is definitely um, our pleasure uh, being here tonight for this really important uh, subject of social emotional learning uh, uh, at home, uh, especially during this time. Uh, our social and emotional health is uh, really important. And so uh, we're from, just moving uh, ahead, we're from Together for Students uh, Chicago, which is a partnership and uh, which is an actual partnership between three organizations that I'll talk about uh, in a second but uh, we're one of four cities that have um, a collaboration um, that is three years and more of these organizations to really positively impact the lives of students and uh, families. And for us here in Chicago, our focus is uh, social and emotional learning uh, because of uh, young people and professionals expressing it as a need even before um, this year that we we've experienced we started back in 2018 and just moving uh, ahead to uh, our collective approach. Uh, honestly, and this was developed by young people that our vision is for Chicago's youth to have access to engaging and learning opportunities, both in and outside of the classroom that um, enable young people to develop their critical SEL skills, they need to succeed in college career and life. Uh, doing this two ways, one with a professional uh, development model that is, works with educators, uh, parents um, to actually share and build capacity around understanding social and emotional learning, while also having a citywide SEL community of practice um, that meets monthly, primarily for youth development practitioners, organizations that primarily serve youth um, educators and just the overall ecosystem um, that supports young people to build the capacity and integration of social emotional learning. So moving on to talk to you a little bit about the uh, organizations, the three organizations that are a part of this. Um, of course, uh, Chicago Public Schools um, and 
one just to acknowledge is one of the third largest, it's the third largest school district in the nation. And so uh, they imagine that this, uh, really focusing on, on social emotional learning here um, really provides a model for the nation. Um, also, uh, specifically the communities and schools um, in Chicago as well as Thrive Chicago. And uh, we are, again, committed to work together for um, at least uh, three years and beyond to really build the capacity, Chicago's capacity in social emotional learning and all of the practices and best practice that we have here available to, to utilize. Um, so I, my, who am I? I'm Kahari Humphreys. Uh, I'm an executive director of uh, School Aid Strategies uh, Thrive Chicago. And we serve as the backbone organization for this partnership. And I'm gonna pass it over to my uh, colleagues to introduce themselves. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Tanya Howell and um, I work for Chicago Public Schools as an SEL integration specialist for 11 competency-based um, schools in the district. I've been in this role for just over a year and I have the opportunity to focus on school-wide SEL strategies as well as supporting individual teachers with really developing a model for integrating SEL into their curriculum. Um, and, and of course, I have the pleasure of working with Kahari and Adina, who you'll hear from next, um, on providing professional development, not just for the schools in our district, but for community-based organizations and families as well. So I'm happy to be here. Good evening, everyone. You've met my colleagues, Kahari and Tanya. My name is Adina Linker. I'm the representative on the Together for Students grant for the organization known as Communities in Schools Chicago. We're a national a network of 174 cities working together to uh, reduce dropout and uh, we're a dropout prevention program. Um, there at Communities and Schools, I support 31 uh, support student or student support managers throughout Chicago Public Schools and in conjunction with my colleagues develop and facilitate professional developments throughout the city, um, both to community partners and external audiences such as you. Um, we're very excited to see you here this evening. If you'd just advance again for me, Duane. Um, tonight, we're gonna to bring to you three different um, sort of uh, presentations regarding social and emotional learning, uh, different perspectives from the, uh, the lens that it comes through our personal lives uh, because we all, as experts in SEL and youth, uh, youth supporting um, community partners, bring something a slightly different uh, to tonight's conversation. I'm gonna speak with you tonight about mindful communication and the importance of modeling social emotional learning in your home and in the community where you support young people. Kahari will come back on screen and talk to you about the importance of finding a way to balance work and home, um, further deepening us into adult SEL practices. And then Tanya will join us to talk about connecting SEL at school and home, especially for those of you who have children um, who are working in remote learning spaces. So moving forward with the slides, I just wanna take a moment to sort of clear the air about what social and emotional learning is. It's not just for kids. It's a process by which all people, young and old, develop the skills and knowledge to support both a healthy identity, uh, emotional expression, including empathy, um, to reach personal and collective goals, maintain supportive relationships, and ultimately to make caring decisions that will impact both them, their family, and their extended community. All of these skills are also very important for, uh, for addressing various forms of inequity so we can empower young people and the adults they work with to co-create thriving communities where they can be safe, healthy, and just as far as the way that they are treated in those spaces. These skills are not only taught in our schools and homes, but they are modeled. And that's where I want to take us this evening as I ask, how do you act when you're escalated? How do you act when you're agitated? And how do you act when you're calm? One of the ways that I approach social emotional learning in our home is to think about these three sort of, here we got them on a stoplight, right? I know how I act when I'm escalated. You could go back for me, Dwayne, we're not quite clear there. I know how I am act when I'm escalated and when I'm agitated. And I learned this as a result of my family telling me, when I'm escalated, I forget to be mindful with my words and my body language. 
and it exacerbates the situation for the young people and my partner in my home. My family tells that they can tell when I'm agitated because I move fast. Most of the time, those around us can tell when we're in an emotional state where we're feeling triggered or perhaps we're on the edge of some emotions that may not even involve them. But most of the time, we're not even attentive to the fact that we're in this state. We also know how the people around us behave when they're calm, how they act and how they speak. Know that our children are watching us all the time, whether they're twins like mine and my Brady Bunch family that we've created here that are out in the world on their own, or they're as young as eight, as you'll hear from my colleague Kahari as he talks about some of the things that happen when he's working in his home with his child who's also going to school. Dwayne, if you'll advance. It's how we communicate when we're supporting the development of these young skills that's so very important, even more important as we're enduring the impact of the coronavirus, basically this trifecta of the coronavirus, uh, social unrest due to police brutality, and then the outcomes of the election. Under the duress of the last nine months, we may find ourselves struggling to remain focused, positive, or even motivated. And we're a species that watches out for negative things, part of the way that we're designed for survival. So I'd like you to think about what you might have been noticing that prompted you to come to this session this evening. Go ahead, Dwayne. Are you noticing connecting or disconnecting behaviors between you and the extended community that you call your family in your home? What we do know is that column of left hand, the yellow column and the left hand side are what's known as connecting habits. These are ways that we can bring ourselves closer together in relationship. On the, on the other side, the right column is what are known as disconnecting habits. And they not only move people apart, but they make it difficult for us when we're isolated and perhaps unable to address these in the ways that we might have done when we had all of our social coping mechanisms available to us. What we do know is that people can consciously choose which behaviors they're going to use to create a positive and caring relationship. It's a lot easier for us as adults because we've had years of practice and we can model things such as trusting and befriending. And we can be attentive to and notice perhaps when we're nagging and complaining and try and be more conscious of that. One of the things that we do know from William Glasner's work is it's possible to interact with people using more than just words. And so when we think about our body language, that's another way that we might be demonstrating some of these either connecting or disconnecting habits. Advance. One thing that I've noticed, at least the people in my family have shared with me, is that I fall into that disconnecting column uh, when I'm hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. And we know when we put those hungry and angry together, we get that candy bar commercial. So I'm sure many of us here can relate to that one. How we engage when we're in one of these states is also important because it's what we're modeling in front of our children. Let's keep in mind that only 10% of conflicts are due to a difference in opinion. The rest of them, 90%, are considered to be um, a challenge, a conflict, because of the tone of voice that we use. And I'll admit, I'm the first one to say, when I'm, I'm a little bit unpleasant when I'm hungry. Let's keep in mind also that there's this thing called emotional contagion. Within 1 20th of a second, our bodies become synchronized to the emotional state of the people that are around us. So if I've had a long day at work and I'm not only right on angry, it's likely that my children are gonna pick up on that and they may even begin to mirror back some of those uh, emotions. Advancing. So here's where the, I want to bring you some information about mindful communication. John Gottman says for every negative thing that we hear, the magic ratio is that we need to hear five positives. Positive feedback encourages us to continue what we're doing. However, negative feedback acts like a warning. It says stop, but it doesn't say what we should do instead. And our bodies get impacted by this, not just the words, but we feel it. I'm sure you felt tension when you've had a difficult conversation with someone. Also, one of the things we should consider is our culture is pale on those positives. We'll dive in and we'll go deep when we have something to criticize or we wanna correct. 
but we don't tend to be as elaborate when we're talking to, about something that someone's done well. The energy, the reactivity, and the animation we radiate when we are pleased is relatively flat in comparison to our verbal and nonverbal responses that have caused us displeasure or frustration. When we're having this type of an exchange with our children, you may recognize them going into survival mode. And it's important then that we respond in a kind and compassionate way. That's especially when it's important to create a calm or predictable transition. We wanna be sure we're praising our children publicly and handling any criticisms that we might need to share with them privately. These are all things that we consider when we're communicating mindfully and we're modeling these skills so that we're supporting the development of social and emotional learning in our children. Next slide. Before I hand it off to Kahari to talk a little bit about how this plays when you're working at home, I wanna offer you this isolation well-being to-do list. Everything that you see on this list could somehow be connected to social emotional learning and it's something that we can do, we can model with our children, we can do with our children, or we help our children do so that they can be more socially and emotionally regulated. For example, self-management involves attending to our physical health, like taking a shower, something that some of us may fall in out of habit while we've been working from home. Or even doing something to get your heart rate up. That's a form of physical health, physical self-management. Relationship building isn't just connecting with a human outside of your home. It could be tending to a plant. Seriously, doing something for someone or something outside of yourself, you're building a relationship. There's a vested interest there. Each of these items on this list could be done with your children or alone, but it's another way to build SEL into your routine. I encourage you to visit the idea of modeling mindfulness for your family, especially as we move into the next segment. My colleague Kahari is now gonna share about balancing work and home. Thanks, Adina. So I was asked by Adina and Tanya to share, we have weekly meetings uh, where we're talking about our work and I was asked, they, I shared a story with them during one of our weekly meetings and they're like, hey, this is something we need to share and talk about a little more broadly. And so just a little context, my, my background, I uh, was a professional, uh, I really worked deeply in positive youth development, um, uh, both in out of school time space, I did a, a training nationally, um, of youth development professionals, organizations around positive youth development um, before I was a parent. <laughs> um, and so specifically, uh, a lot of the practices like adultism and uh, really just understanding SEL in relation to building strong relationships with young people was all from the context of a person that did it professionally and not as a parent. Now I'm a father of two boys and a husband of a third grade teacher. Um, and I usually work away from home um, in an office away from the house. And um, when COVID hit, when COVID hit and we had to uh, be in, in the and how in the home together and um, my relationship with my family and my job uh, co collided in a way that I'm sure many people have experienced in um, over the last the last uh, year. And initially it was uncomfortable uh, and, then it, and then it became a little bit intriguing because it was new um, when we were doing different and new things. Um, and I did everything from creating interesting workspaces in remote places like stairwells um, to, to take, taking daily walks in a way that I hadn't done and was dependent upon um, just for my sanity. Then going to, uh, then moving to like actually deciding to go to an empty office to reestablish boundaries, um, to coming back home and sharing a desk with my eight year old um, while he's in class. Um, and what I want to just acknowledge is that during all that time, um, there was an acknowledgement one that I talked to the group about around the transitioning of the work, um, the, the vacation, weekend, evening, a father that I had with my sons where they had complete access to me, to shifting to a, um, a work from home relationship where despite my, you know, this increased presence that I was there, um, our, the access to me 
um, in the way the free access that my three-year-old had and my you know eight-year-old uh, just wasn't the same. And in many cases, it impacted um, how we related. And so this, period that I'm, uh, this next kind of portion will really talk a little bit about the adult SEL and the things that we have to do ourselves to, to, to really model um, and support the social and emotional development of our children. And you know, this, this moment, like, as I mentioned, was intriguing because you know, children, even while they're being taught remotely, um, they're learning on their own. Um, and, they're, and they're primary source, uh, and they are the primary source of their self-management. And we are the model of our self-management while we're there with them, while we're home with them. We're modeling self-management um, and self-awareness. So moving on to the next one, uh, just honestly, moving on to the next slide, wanted to just demonstrate and share um, some things that I think a lot of people know and I've learned during this time, but just wanted to reinforce that routines create certainty. And then this is a really important part of, of how we're showing up is, are these routines, these routines that we that are needed for our young people, consistent, consistency of the wake up times, meals, exercising. Um, I know there's a, uh, there, in many cases, if young people are working remotely, they have routines that their schools um, have implemented in relation to working remotely, but young people have to self-manage that and need support doing that while also um, needing to see you doing the same. The other piece is that routines were not only good, and I noticed that with my sons, uh, but I, the other piece is that routines are not only good for them or were good for my sons, but really for my emotional state. Uh, and so that's really where adult SEL comes in and moving on to the next slide, just to share what adult SEL is. Uh, adult SEL is the process of helping parents, educators, and youth practitioners build their expertise and skills to lead social emotional learning initiatives, also involves cultivating adults on social emotional competencies. And it's really being a, a, a aware of where you are, uh, specifically as we, uh, and really supporting, uh, being able to support and model how you and model that to your children. Uh, and then it, a bigger, a big part of it is self-care and self-care practices. And what were your self-care practices initially before this moment, I'm sure have changed um, in response to this moment. Um, and then also cultivating and practicing SEL skills with your child. Having uh, the story that I've told uh, to many people is when I was a, uh, in a, I was working in a, uh, a park district and I was in a basement. It was during a tornado, a tornado, not tornado drill, but it was actually a tornado um, warning. And so we were all in, in the, in the, in the, in the basement, in the locker room, and the, my group was really scared. And I was terrified. I was younger. I was, you know, in my early 20s, and I was terrified myself. And it was a moment that I had when I watched those young people and how scared they were. And I realized that I had to deal with my fear while dealing with their fear at the same time so that they could, this moment could not be devastating and traumatic for them. So I started playing games and and all kinds of things and forgot how scared I was. But I think that that really comes, that moment, I'm reminded of that moment all the time now with my children in this, um, these series of moments that we've experienced in 2020. Uh, moving on to self-awareness. So there are five, um, there are actually five castle core competencies in relation to, to social emotional learning, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. But we're going to focus specifically on self-awareness and um, some of the things that we can do as older <laughs> young people uh, uh, to really be aware of, of, of where, how we're showing up in these moments. Um, moving on to the next one, there's a group um, called the Conscious Leadership Group who has a really, they have an awesome book, which I'll share later the 15 commitments to conscious leadership and they have a real some great tools to help adults with their emotional intelligence one of them is really is presencing yourself and it's it's at any given time checking in with yourself to see where are you and one of the examples they use are you above the line or below the line and above the line being open curious and committed to learning and below the line being closed defensive and committed to being right 
and that depending upon where you are and your awareness of where you are will help you uh, relate to your partner, will help you relate to your coworkers, will help you relate to your child. Um, and so being able to stop and ask yourself um, where you are uh, then allows you the benefit of shifting. Another similar, uh, similar tool uh, to the conscious leaderships uh, above and below the line as the, in the next slide is the mood meter uh, developed a par partnership with uh, Mark Brackett for, you know, uh, he's the author of the power of an emotional intelligence uh, to achieve well-being and success and the Yale School of um, uh, the Yale Emotional Intelligence, intelligence Center um, developed this really cool app um, that is the mood meter. And all, all it basically asks you to do at any given time is to check in with where you are. You know, what is your feeling state at that moment, at that now moment? What is your feeling state? Um, so that we don't, and I had a conversation earlier with a friend about, we don't always follow the signs um, and are aware of the signs of our, um, of our, of our just our body. So sometimes we ignore anger and then that anger or we ignore mood and that grows into anger and that anger grows into a response and an action. And so our, the, more, the more that we are, we're able to actually be directly in tune with how we're feeling at any given time, it really helps us to shift and be supportive to those around us. Um, so the, and another piece that is another um, piece that comes actually from the youth development world is another ism, uh, adultism. You know, we've all heard of racism and sexism. Um, uh, we've maybe even heard of ageism, which is, uh, which is actually the opposite of adultism because ageism focuses on um, uh, the, the utilizing power and, and discriminate against the people that are older. Uh, adultism is, is really the, the power adults have over children, nearly, oh, excuse me, that was my internal timer to stop talking. <laughs> so adultism is, is how we as uh, adults kind of have power over young people. And really in many cases, our, as parents, we're there to, to provide safety, but when triggered and when in really high stress situations, that can sometimes shift to control. And so in many cases, there are five, I'll go to the next one, the five kind of behaviors and related to adultism and the two that I'll acknowledge that are really coming up now in this moment is dysfunctional rescuing and blaming the victim. And dysfunctional rescuing is basically the idea that you help when help is not needed, but instead of pushing, instead of you know, pushing your, your child in moments um, you just kind of help them. <laughs> and so my, my son comes to me all the time, like, how do I spell this word? And if I'm in a meeting and I'm on, and I'm on a Zoom at, at that time and I press mute and I'm, I'll tell him, I'll spell the word for him versus really encouraging him and continuing to encourage him uh, to, to scaffold him to actually find the word. So in these moments now that are a little more stressful, sometimes we'll lean uh, into this dysfunctional rescue and also blaming the victim. Uh, somehow, some way, this idea that the things that are occurring are young people's fault. Um, this moment is not young people's fault. Um, and what's going on is it. And so really, again, go being aware of where, where we are and when we and, and what our feelings are uh, at the particular moment helps us to better uh, mitigate potentially ad adultist responses um, to young people. Uh, moving on to the last slide, and then I'll put, what I'll do is I'll put a bunch of resources in the chat um, from a lot of the areas that I've shared in this uh, 10 minutes. But, you know, this, our adult SEL is really based upon our perception of who we are, you know, and what we want, our, our perception of how we show up. And there's a, I love this uh, image uh, about the public self, you know, wants to display uh, who, you know, a certain uh, wellness, a certain state that the private self may not be experiencing. And then in this moment uh, where we are, um, there, is, there is kind of a clash of our private and public selves. Our, you know, our public selves are in our home and our private selves are available for everyone to see that this is definitely a moment for awareness 
and it's a definitely a moment for us to build our own adult social emotional uh, social emotional uh, state and learning so that we can best support young people at home. So I'll, I'll go ahead and pass it on to Tanya and um, for the next part. Awesome, thank you, Kahari, and uh, good, e good evening again, everyone. Um, I'm gonna share with you uh, some information around connecting social emotional learning uh, with, between home and school. And I, I was joking earlier in telling my colleagues that this is an actual photo from my, from my house during remote learning. Um, at times, this is what my daughter looks like trying to navigate remote learning, manage her emotions, and you know, maintain energy throughout the day and stamina to get through everything that needs to, to happen. So, um, so yeah, I'm gonna share with you some concrete resources and also just what does SEL look like in Chicago Public Schools right now? Uh, what does SEL look like in the classroom? So as a district, uh, Chicago Public Schools has named SEL as the top priority um, in terms of supporting young people and the adults who are working with the young people on um, taking care of themselves and taking care of one another. So if you have young, um, young people at home who are engaged with remote learning, you may have seen some of these strategies being used um, with, their, uh, with their classrooms and with their, with their teachers. Um, some of the strategies include check-in and check-out questions and check-out activities. So teachers are using um, this check-in, check-out strategy for a few reasons. One is to, is to better understand how students are coming into the space of the virtual classroom. What is their mood like? What are their emotions like? And what is their readiness to learn look like in that moment? We know that this is something that can change day to day. So it's not something that teachers do once a month or once a week, but they may be doing check-ins daily. Um, teachers are also doing check-out activities to respond to what came up during the check-in or to check for understanding. It could be something that's related to the content academically, or it could be something that's related to um, something that came up in the classroom related to social emotional learning. Teachers are also uh, very strategically building learning communities within their classrooms. So they're using strategies to get to know their students better. They're sharing themselves with their students. They're building trusting relationships within that classroom so that students feel vulnerable enough to say when they're struggling or to say when they are doing something really well. In the virtual world, teachers are also using things like polls and Google Meets. They're also using Jamboards, um, which is a really awesome online tool for collaboration and for students to share ideas, not just related to SEL, but related to the content as well. They're also using Pear Decks where students can engage um, with each other online to answer questions about what they're learning or to answer questions about themselves and how they're feeling. Um, teachers are very strategically including students' interests and their voice into the classroom. They're bringing in student culture and families into the virtual space. You may have heard these terms, synchronous and asynchronous time. They were sort of new for me this year, and I think I've used the word asynchronous more uh, in the past six months than I have in my entire life. But teachers are balancing and supporting students with balancing the synchronous and the asynchronous time. Uh, so if this is new to you, synchronous time is where the teacher is actively teaching, the students are engaged in a lesson, um, a live lesson online, there's back and forth engagement. And the asynchronous time is where students are asked to sort of manage their own time. They may be given an assignment or a group project if they're in breakout rooms. And this is a time where SEL is really important because the students are expected to, uh, to manage their time, to, to think about pacing, to think about what to do when they're struggling. This is a time when they have to access those executive functioning skills that helps them to process information, retain new information, and perform on either an assignment or a project or an assessment. And as Kahari and Adina both mentioned, the SEL strategies that teachers are focusing on in the entire district are those around self-awareness and self-management, showing and having empathy, social awareness, responsible decision-making, and building and maintaining positive relationships. 
So your young people at home may be familiar with this language and you could ask them questions about what they're learning um, related to SEL. So we're gonna do a quick SEL check-in together. This is something that I've actually seen in a, in a high school classroom and I've also used with adults. Um, so what I want you to do is take a look at the six pictures here and think about which picture best describes your mood in this moment. And then I want you to reflect on why you're feeling that way. Um, and in the chat, just put the number of the image and then just put a quick phrase or statement about why that picture best describes your current mood. I see uh, number two, curious to learn more. Uh, two, happy. I see overwhelmed, tired. I see a bunch of sixes, tired. Um, some twos in there. One, have to start cooking, right? That's gonna be my face soon. Three, curious. Two, thankful. Five, because it looks cozy, yeah. Six, would like to run away and get a break. I hear you. Three, lots to do, where do I start? Lots going on and not to be celebrating our daughter's birthday. Yeah, birthdays are really challenging right now during COVID. One, we have some kids arguing in the background. So yeah, keep, keep um, responding in the chat. Uh, so this is an activity where teachers can use it with the classroom. You can imagine in a class of 25 or 30, you could get a sense of where students are in this current moment. And I actually saw a teacher yesterday who did a check-in similar to this with their students and realized that many people were out of six. And the teacher had content ready to go, was, was going to teach some time management strategies, but decided because so many of the students were out of six, he gave them work time instead because clearly they, they just needed to sort of take a break from, from hearing him teach or from having something else added to their plate. And he gave them just space, to, space and time to work. And he said, you don't have to just work on my assignments, but work on anything that really just needs to get done. Knock some things off of your to-do list. So that might help them to feel a little bit better so they're not so tired. So that's a way a teacher can use a strategy like this and then respond and maybe shift plans um, based on the student feedback. All right, we're gonna do another SEL activity together. So if you grab your phone, your smartphone or, or on your computer, go to www.menti.com. This will take us to a Mentimeter link. And at the top, it'll ask you to enter a code. The code is 21067055. You can see that on the middle of the screen. So again, it's 21. 06755. And when you enter that code, you're going to be prompted to answer a question. Um, so if you could click on the live results, Dwayne, we can see how people are responding to what does remote learning uh, look like in your home uh, right now? Awesome. So as folks are entering their um, responses, we'll get to see, you know, how, how, how would you describe remote learning in your home? And I can put the code in the chat as well. You go to menti.com and then it's 
let me know if you're having trouble seeing those questions when you go to menti.com. Well, we can always come back to this as well if we're having tech technical issues. This is uh, one of the things that happens when you use technology in a presentation. And also, you can imagine what teachers um, suffer through when they're using technology with their students in, um, in remote learning. It doesn't work exactly how, how they want. So we can come back to this um, a little bit later, maybe at the end of the presentation to see what the results are. And I'll try to do some troubleshooting on my end. Um, but we can go back to the slide deck as well. So if you can get into menti.com um, and, and enter that code, we'll, we'll check back in a little bit. Um, while you're doing that, I'll just share with you uh, some strategies for making remote learning work for us. Okay. Um, so the first, the first strategy is to set manageable goals. Um, hourly, daily, weekly, monthly, or by semester, depending on the age or developmental level of your children. When we think about supporting our youngest, our youngest children, our pre-K and kindergarten students, what manageable uh, schedule or goals would look like could be um, what's coming up next time management strategies. We're thinking of visual and consistent schedules with pictures. So somewhere in, in your home, maybe on a wall behind the kitchen table or even on the fridge, you could um, you could put uh, just a visual of what the day is going to look like for them. You know, are they starting with breakfast and then getting on remote learning? Are they going to have a, a movement break in there? When is lunchtime? So really chunking out the day um, and creating a, a visual schedule for our pre-K and kindergarten um, children. If you have students or children in grades um, first through third, what you might do is just review their schedule for, for them um, at the beginning of the day and then try to track where they are throughout the day. So maybe just do some check-ins throughout the day. Um, when we think about our fourth through eighth grade um, students or children, you wanna start to encourage them to, to use a personal calendar or like a, an agenda book um, or even just a notebook so that they can sort of log what they need to do throughout the day and kind of do some self-checking um, as they progress through their day. And then for high school students, a really great strategy for thinking about self-management, time management, and setting manageable goals is for them to, to spend a couple days tracking how are they really spending their time. Because sometimes high school students will say, I just don't have time to finish all of this work. I don't have time to, to do all of these assignments. But if they start tracking how they're spending you know, each minute of the day, and they can chunk it into five minutes at a time. Literally write down what you're doing every five to 10 minutes. What they will see is that they actually have more space in their day than they think. And so they can start to, to better utilize the time that they have and to set some goals for themselves as well. You also wanna encourage self-awareness um, for all children of all ages. When are you at your best? When do you focus uh, best during the day? Um, are you a morning person? Are you a, a night owl? And just start helping them to develop strategies that, that work for them individually, because it's not a one size fits all. Um, also, the work environment is really important for you and for your children. So like Ahari mentioned, consistency is really important here. Having a space, even if it's just a small place in the, in, in the house or the apartment, where you know, they can set up their laptop or their device, have a notebook, a couple of pencils, a water bottle, maybe even a snack, 
how do they need to set up that environment so that they can be productive throughout the day? And it definitely does look different for everybody. I know in my household, I'm working remotely and I have two um, young people at home and all of our work environments look a little bit different. You know, my son really needs a lot of structure with a desk and a pencil cup and notebooks and everything set up for his day. And he stays there all day. My daughter has to move around. So if she's not moving, she's getting bored. She gets antsy. So she sometimes works on her bed. She sometimes works at the kitchen table. She sometimes has to sit on the couch. Um, so it's, it's, it's important to think about what works for each person in the household and then allow space for that individuality. Um, make sure to take regular movement breaks, even if it's just a stretch to get up and you know move around the house a little bit and take some regular mental breaks. Close the laptop, maybe turn off your phone for 30 minutes in the day, just to sort of let your mind rest um, before you get back into all the, all the tasks of the day. And self-care is just as important for young people as it is for us as adults. Um, the little kitty cat there is saying, it's a good day to take care of yourself and so is every other day. Um, this, this activity here was done in a classroom where the teacher, and I've seen this used in, in a classroom in, in, in CPS, where teachers asked the students to create a self-care plan. And so they thought about how am I taking care of myself mentally? How am I taking care of myself physically? And how am I taking care of myself spiritually? And so students are able to think about what strategies work for them when they think about self-care in those ways. There's a section here also for who are the people in your, in your world who are supportive? So those go-to people who can help you out if you're having a tough time or go-to people who can help you out if, if, you need, if you need any kind of support. And then what are some of your goals for yourself when you're thinking about self-care? And so this is a strategy that you could use at home. You could post it up um, so that just to keep it fresh in your mind um, and for the young people in the household as well. So on the next slide, we're gonna spend just a moment thinking about affirmations. So I've used affirmations in my personal life and my professional life. And when we use an affirmation, what we do is take a problem or a concern or a worry, and we flip that fear or worry or concern into a positive statement. And then you wanna post that statement um, where you'll see it every single day, whether it's on the mirror in your bathroom or on the refrigerator, or in a space that you're, gonna, that you're gonna pass by every day. So first you name what are you most concerned about, and then you flip it into a worry or fear. And so on the next slide, I'll give you an example of, of my personal affirmation that I have posted. Um, my fear and my worry was that there's not enough balance um, between work slash school in my household and joy, because we used to leave the house to go to work and to go to school, and we would come home and this would be our sanctuary where we would listen to music and eat food and talk about our day. Um, where now all of those things are kind of intermingled and I'm here at work right now and my children are getting antsy in the background because they're ready for dinner. You know, so there's this, like Kari said, a collision of work and home. And so I worry that there's not enough balance. So my affirmation is we have balance between work and school and joy in our home. And so I flip that, that worry or fear into an affirmation. I, I post that and I read it. And when I read it, I help it to manifest and to become true. And I'll leave you with one final thought. This is a mantra that sort of represents me and how I think about this moment, which is whatever the present moment contains, embrace it as if you had chosen it yourself. So with all the things going on in the world around us, it's important to just embrace this moment and find positive uh, a positive way to, to look at things. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you um, for, for your time. I'm gonna pass it back to Kahari and then uh, we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end. Thanks, Tanya. Just, uh, we wanted to just acknowledge um, some of the uh, organizations and groups that have made this, um, this resource available and possible for educators, parents, um, and organizations uh, strive together, Institute for Educational Leadership and Coalition for Community Schools and Community Schools. These are some of our national sponsors, 
Organic Oneness, a Chicago Public Schools um, Competency Based Education Initiative, Thrive Chicago, um, our, our, lo our local partners, our University of Chicago's Urban Education Institute. So just wanted to acknowledge that. Also throwing in the uh, in the in the chat an exit slip. So it says link if you wanted to give any feedback for the information today, how we could better support and craft um, sessions like this for parents. Um, so your feedback would be awesome. And I think we have a little bit of time for a que um, questions and answers um, if, if anyone has any. And thank you. I see there's one question about uh, will a recording be available and I, that's a yes and um, Dwayne can confirm it if I'm if I'm wrong but yes there are recordings of all of the parent series sessions so even if you missed one uh, they're they're available. And we have our Mentimeter results. So there we go. Challenging is in the center. Lonely is, is a big one as well. Frustrating, exhausting. But then we also have smooth. Um, we have easy. More breathing. close than ever. That's beautiful. More close than ever. Yeah. So thank you all for that feedback. I'll leave this up as we continue to. Um, answer questions as well. Hello, there was a question about what age do your recommendations start at? So some of the, the strategies that we offered can start as early as pre-K age um, young people. So four, three, four, and five. Um, we can, in the follow-up email, send some additional specific strategies for our youngest students and we can go all the way through high school. Um, with the amount of time we had, it's hard to share some, there's so much to share, but um, we can definitely send some links to additional resources that give very specific strategies um, for the different age groups. There's also a question, Tanya, how do we help children be physically strong during the long online sitting hours? So we know that children are accustomed to moving around in school, transitioning from space to space, and now they're being much more sedentary. Any thoughts there? Yeah, absolutely. So movement breaks are really important. And again, we can put in the follow-up email. There are some online resources for um, structured movement breaks that you can use with children of all ages. Um, but encouraging students to get up and stretch, maybe do some yoga poses. I do know that, um, PE is still happening in classrooms um, across the district or in schools across the district. And so really encouraging uh, young people to participate fully in those PE classes where students are asked to move and stretch and, and do different exercises. Um, I would also encourage students to change up their location a little bit like for lunchtime to maybe move away from their computer or their laptop or the device and find a different place to sit and eat lunch and really honor that time um, away, from, uh, away from where they've been sitting all day. I'd also add that if it's possible to chunk their time so that every 20 minutes, maybe they're getting that stretch break that you're talking about. Um, in order to maintain longer attention, um, we need to be able to break things into smaller manageable time periods because they certainly wouldn't, we don't sit for the level or you know, for the length of time um, so even like a kitchen timer or something like that, so that they have an opportunity to just do a side bend or a couple jumping jacks, um, that, that can be helpful. Absolutely. Teachers are not, I'm sorry, teenagers are not turning on their camera for a variety of reasons. There's a whole list of them. We could do a whole session on that. How to encourage community when it's just the teacher talking and you see no one else or their reactions. Yeah, this one is really tricky because the messaging from the district has been that teachers can't require uh, students to turn on their cameras for a variety of reasons. Like you said, Adina, we could probably do a whole session just on that. But one thing that has helped um, in my household is that I've, I, asked the, I asked my children to participate in the parent-teacher conferences that just happened last week. And when they heard directly from the teachers how important it is um, to be able to see their face and to engage and, and to build a community through that 
um, face to face interaction. You know, I talk to them about just um, trying to use their camera as much as possible. Um, it's hard when most of the class has their camera off for a young person to kind of put themselves out there and, and turn their camera on along with the teacher. But the more students that do it, the more it'll become the norm. Um, and so it does take a few brave souls to, to start turning on their computer if that's not the norm in that particular class. Um, also, encouraging young people to have a morning routine that starts before class starts. So they're actually getting up, they're washing their face, they're putting on a fresh outfit, you know, doing something with their hair. And so that way, when they are, when the class starts, they are camera ready, you know, because we know that's important for young people to be ready to be in front of that camera. So maybe waking them up 30 minutes earlier than they have been waking up so that they have that time in the morning to really just get ready for the day. I think it's also important, and I know Kahari, you talk about grace all the time, to recognize that our young people are in a, a very different educational environment. And we know, those of us that sit in these video calls throughout the day, that this is a taxing uh, process of being on screen. Uh, so negotiating that perhaps a particular class is where they could be more visually engaged, or as Tanya was saying, starting the day off on camera um, and maybe weaning their way off as their eyes become fatigued or something like that. But trying to normalize and socialize the idea of those body language exchanges, but also recognizing that there's a fatigue factor with the screens. I see another question specifically about night routine. And I know that there was a session last Tuesday, I don't know that you two participate in in relation to rest and sleep and night routine. Did you want to share anything uh, about the question about what about night routine? Yeah, for sure. So there were some suggestions that came up last week about um, having a transition time between school and work uh, and evening activities and then bedtime. So powering down, having screens off, having some moment at the end of the day to reflect on the day, whether it's just asking your children, like, how was your day? What was the most exciting part? What was the most challenging part? really having time to unpack the day before you lay down to rest um, will help with that nighttime routine. I think if we we've have got time, time for there's one, one more question. question. Yep. Um, I, just wanna, I just wanna touch upon this one, Dwayne. Um, Irene is asking about difficult teachers that may cause stress for children or parents during Zoom classes. And I think I would just want to reiterate the importance of grace. We don't know what's happening in our educators' households, Kahari hinted at what it is like to do his job and also be involved in education. His wife is a teacher. Um, I think the most important thing is to try and strengthen the relationship that you have with that educator uh, and recognize that we're all going through very difficult, uncharted territory. Um, it's not a solution to assume that uh, there's nothing that can be done to strengthen the relationship that you have with that educator reaching out to them and reconnecting with them through a different means may give you more insight and, and may provide a space for you to share that there are some unique challenges your family is experiencing. Yeah, I would just um, double down on that and say to send an email or to ask, speak to the teacher, um, you know, independently of your child at first to find out what's going on. And so that you can share your concerns about how your child is experiencing that teacher. Uh, because sometimes they need to hear it from you to, re to recognize what it is that they're doing that's causing harm um, or causing stress. But I think the best way to handle that is one-on-one uh, -on -one with the teacher first and then bringing in your young person um, once you have a better grasp of, and a better relationship with that teacher so that, you know, um, that the, once your child comes into that conversation, they see some solidarity there. Yeah, you know, I would also say that there is a piece in relation to the SEL conversation around social awareness um, in relation to screen. There's all, we're also seeing uh, bullying uh, happening, happening where young people are making comments about others' backgrounds and things of that sort. Uh, so just really encouraging you know, social awareness, um, grace for others, understanding is, is really important. Uh, thank you very much. I'm glad we had time for that Q&A. Um, and I appreciate um, everybody's participation. Our audience tonight, um, all of our partners, Adina, Tanya, Kahari. Uh, I'd also like to thank Carmela and Sid, our, 
uh, as I say, a Vince team that has been just doing a yeoman's job uh, during all of these sessions and getting us together and giving us tips on how to look our best on screen. Um, I, I want to share something quickly while we're closing out and we're about to close out. And so a couple of just notes, cause they've came up in the chat multiple times. We're going to try to collect all of the links that have been shared inside of the chat to put those items in our follow-up email, which will also include a recording of the session and a copy of the deck. And typically we do that in 24 to 36 hours. So uh, it'll hit your email that you registered with. Uh, very soon, um, and you'll get get a, get a copy of that. Um, I too am a, a parent of a high school senior in CPS, so we're applying to college in the pandemic. And our second session in this series was about applying to college in a pandemic. That was selfishly for me. My wife is a CPS principal, so she has been managing um, a school uh, on, on in North Lawndale. Uh, and our school has been a, a, a meal distribution site this entire time. And yesterday I was on a call with some teachers meeting like this about a program I won out of the university. Uh, and I broke down in the session. Like I was so thankful for the teachers and the hard work they were doing and just felt overwhelmed, right? So like, and it was okay. I mean, I'm okay with that anyway, as a, as a person confident and comfortable with themselves to cry in front of students, cry in front of adults, cry with my family, cry when I'm happy, cry when I'm sad. But it was very emotional that, we were working hard. So um, just that idea of grace, Kahari and I speak about that on a regular basis via text that we gotta just provide a space for forgiveness for everyone. We're all going through this collectively. Uh, that's not excusing anything or anyone. We're, we're trying really, diff really difficult things. And th there's, there's some transitions that are gonna happen. There might be some ends in sight. Uh, there might be some things that might change, but but some of these things are going to be with us for, for a great deal of time. So we have to take care of ourselves as adults. We have to take care of those that take care of others. Um, and, and we have to make sure we remind ourselves uh, our young people are going through an unprecedented time, but we are as well. And so all of those recommendations are very useful and helpful to me personally uh, to share with my household um, in this time as well. So um, thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, thanks again to our planning team, to the School of Social Service Administration. Um, what, however you choose to celebrate, uh, whether that's just celebrating time uh, with your family off of Zoom, off of the computer, um, if you choose to do a teach-in or, or fast or ce celebrate indigenous folks in this time period, uh, just please take care, be safe, um, and, and, and we look forward to uh, having some additional sessions uh, moving forward in the new year as well. Um, so be well, be safe, and see, see you soon. See everybody that I can see soon. <laughs>